is an in informal discussion, not a fancy webinar presentation uh, for those who uh, may want to quote us or, or look at the YouTube. So um, let's get started. So uh, for those who don't know us, uh, oh, wait, okay. So uh, the High Speed Rail Alliance is a uh, nonprofit. Uh, we're focused on education. We strive to be the most knowledgeable uh, independent source of what high speed rail is, why we should build it and what our local leaders can do to make it happen. Um, we're very excited about California uh, because it is the only high speed line under construction today. And so I'm gonna cover an awful lot um, and uh, so I want to bring it up right a quick. This is the core of the thing. In the next six weeks, the legislature in California will make a critical vote on what to do as the next step on their high-speed rail map. Um, uh, the authority has an excellent plan for moving forward. Um, they are asking the authority to release the final 4.1 billion of funds approved by the California voters 10 years ago um, in 2008. Um, this is a critical vote for the country. They have already really helped move uh, high-speed rail forward um, across the country by uh, forcing changes in regulations, getting uh, the regulators used to dealing with these kinds of issues getting through uh, institutional issues of other kinds. Um, it's really the learning ground for the rest of the country. And it's true, there's some uh, lessons learned that certainly we can learn from. Um, and that is the main the most important message is do your planning up front and make sure you have the planning ready to go when you have the money. Um, so, we really need to get our friends in California. If you have friends in California, get them to contact their legislators and I'll tell you about how you can do that later. Uh, so back to us, um, we use research to be the most knowledgeable folks independent. There's a lot of people in this country that know how to build high-speed rail, but they're not talking because they do it for hire. Uh, we can help um, our leaders understand what they can do we educate folks through, I've been doing a Rotary Club presentation once or twice a day for about, um, for uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, and then we provide you and others the tools you need in order to educate your leaders in state capitals and in Washington. Um, we do this because it will lead to stronger communities. Uh, you know, the more people travel, we're really spread out as a country with our universities in small towns, especially where I live in the Midwest, big cities, just a few major airports. Um, our families are spread out, our customers and vendors are spread out. The more we can travel, the more productive we can be and the stronger our relationships will be. Um, and in the process we'll reduce, even though we're increasing traffic travel, we will dramatically reduce carbon emissions and by, generate, by being a catalyst for more walkable communities, will we reduce the burden of infrastructure maintenance that local communities are really struggling with right now. Um, our big picture goal um, is a federal program and a big one. And we're really excited that Congressman Moulton from Boston is um, being such a strong champion for this big program. Um, I was really impressed with his uh, work yesterday on the House TNI committee. It's a long committee meeting, but um, really a fantastic outline of what the issues are. And Congressman Moulton really drove the conversation towards high-speed rail. Uh, so that's exciting. We need to be very optimistic. We need to plan for success. Um, and that's a combination of long-term big picture projects and getting things done right now. Um, and then because uh, we do believe in an integrated network where most of the route miles are on 
tracks shared with freight trains and the high speed lines boost to the volume and really bring the tipping point to the whole network. But getting the private railroads engaged as true partners that are making money at it, the same way highway contractors make a lot of money building highways and defense contractors make a lot of money building weapons. So we are at a unique time where we can really make a difference and I just want to point out, we've got the president around stumping for high-speed rail. Uh, this is fantastic. And again, we really need to, to get people, anybody who wants a train, a better train, a new train, anywhere in the country, we need to get them engaged in telling their congressmen it's time to have a national program. So we don't see this as, um, and I wanted focus a little bit more than usual on creating a new language about how we talk about this. Because um, in order to understand what's happening in California, you really have to think about um, high-speed rail very differently than it's been promoted. So typically, high-speed rail has been promoted as big city to big city, 100 to 300 miles apart. Certainly, a high-speed train going 300 miles um, is far superior to flying and um, will shun that market. But there is a much, 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 much bigger market for passenger trains than just downtown to downtown between city and city. And high-speed rail is the key tipping point that makes the whole system work. Uh, so we see this as a series of building blocks. The faster you go, the uh, you need to take different steps. So for practical purposes, and we'll see there's two cases where hopefully we'll have trains going 110 miles an hour on heavy haul freight track. But right now it's pretty much agreed that 90 miles an hour is the practical limit for that. Um, to go faster than 110, you need to separate the roads. To go faster than 125, you need to electrify. Both of those things are a good idea no matter what. Um, if you want to go faster than 90 or 110, you probably need to build a new right of way, especially here in the Midwest, where uh, we're going through towns um, every five miles. Uh, you really need to get a new right of way to really get the frequency and the speed that you need to get over the tipping point. Um, uh, and Ned is saying the Wolverine line already goes 110. Uh, but not, um, uh, not shared with heavy freight trains is the point there. Um, so the, um, uh, to take this and kind of simplify the discussion, we've created three categories of infrastructure. Uh, shared use lines, which are primarily owned by private companies um, with a focus on freight, um, but we have shared use lines around the country that work very well. Uh, Metra here in Chicago um, has pre-COVID 90 to 100 uh, passenger trains a day on some of the busiest freight lines in the country. And it works very well because they've invested in the infrastructure to make it work well. Uh, Brightline in Florida is another excellent example. Uh, so that's shared use. Regional is where the probably a government entity owns the tracks and it's focused on passenger and it may have some freight. Uh, so um, the Chicago to Detroit, the segment between Porter and Dearborn um, is being upgraded to regional. Um, and that's the Wolverine going at 110. You've also got uh, Nick D from Chicago to South Bend. Um, as two examples of this um, in, in the, the states. And then high speed lines are where you're building completely new infrastructure um, and preferably for speeds above 200 miles an hour. Now, one problem that we've had is that all of these, all of the planning to date, except in one key exception, has been done segment by segment, route by route instead of in an integrated way. So you can't, because of that, 
say on Rockford to Chicago, uh, if you just look at Rockford to Chicago with a couple of steps in between, then you have one level of traffic. But if you can look at Rockford to Chicago and then the connections to Detroit and Indianapolis and Kankakee, et cetera, suddenly there's a, not, a lot more opportunity to take the Rockford to Chicago train. So there's a better, stronger builder case, building business case for building substantially more um, infrastructure. Um, and yes, this is being recorded. So you need an integrated network plan and we need to get to much lighter, um, safer trains than what much of the country is operating today. I think it's unacceptable that here in Chicago, we have trains um, that were built in 1956 that are still in revenue service on Metro. Um, again, to talk more about, to get down to this language, um, this is an excellent example of a shared use line, uh, the Bright Line in uh, Florida, where they're planning on hourly service um, at 90 miles an hour on the section that was operating pre-COVID and hopefully will be uh, reopening this fall. Uh, that's 80 miles an hour, I'm sorry. Uh, they're planning on 110 up to Coco, and then they're building a new line across the rest of the state. Um, kind of the one very, very good example of how a shared use line can work. And another example of planning for success, um, um, planning for success by planning on hourly service from the outset, not thinking, well, we'll start with two trains a day and then maybe we'll go to three, that you really have to have frequency to make it work and so they're planning for the success by launching with hourly service. Um, and uh, yes, Tom, it is diesel electric, but to simplify, we just call it diesel. Uh, the most uh, 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 robust regional line that we have in the country today is the Northeast Corridor. Um, and the most robust of that is the uh, section in New Jersey where it's four tracks. Um, and soon we'll be going 160 miles an hour. Um, so this is basically taking a, an older legacy line over time, removing the grade crossings. Um, um, there's still some freight trains on here that you really would prefer to have them elsewhere. Uh, a slightly more rigid track. In some cases, you've got separate tracks for the express trains and local trains, and sometimes they're shared. Uh, this has been a long process. Uh, the country started the process with the signing of, or, um, actually you could say it started the process with the electrification in the 30s. The next step up was the Metroliner project that was uh, signed by um, LBJ. Constant improvements, um, certainly a success story, uh, but could be a, a bigger success story with a lot more focused investment. Um, and then the last is high-speed lines where you're building completely new infrastructure, um, preferably um, alongside interstates or other places where you're not having to cut across the land. Um, but this is actually a picture of the transition um, on the Milan to Bologna line where they were alongside the old railroad and now they're going to be alongside uh, the Autostrada. Um, and then these pieces can fit together in many different ways, depending upon what local assets you have, um, what your local market needs, and we'll add buses into this as a really critical part of making this whole thing work. Um, so if you think about these different pieces in California, um, as we move forward, it starts to understand why the different segments are happening the way they're happening. So California has been a huge innovator uh, for 30 years now. Um, in 1990, the voters agreed to a big package of infrastructure spending that included the most aggressive program for building commuter rail, light rail, and expanded Amtrak service um, across the state. And as a result of that, their three routes are basically the busiest routes outside the Northeast Corridor for Amtrak. 
Um, and this is a picture of my son. Uh, we're about to get on a, a surf liner train at Oceanside to go up to um, LA. So they've been, they've basically converted, they've taken a state that was almost entirely focused on driving and made it possible to get most places in the state by public transit. Probably not as fast as you'd want it to be or um, as reliable or as frequently as we'd want to be, but it's a huge transformation. And that's the foundation that high-speed rail is being added into. Um, this is the existing Amtrak network. And I've, we've added into this the buses to point out that this is a pretty extensive network with these buses that um, every Amtrak train that comes into Bakersfield, there's an easy connection to a bus. Um, and there's a bus that goes to Las Vegas, buses that go down into the Inland Valley um, and the Antelope Valley. And sometimes there's multiple buses going to the LA area, uh, but, but um, every train is met by a bus. And the vast majority of people getting on and off a train in Bakersfield are taking a bus for part of that trip. So that's a huge market to build upon. Um, soon there will be a new bus line across here. It was going to launch right before COVID um, and it will launch across COVID to connect this part of the valley to San Jose. And then all of these buses up here and then the three Amtrak routes. What's missing from this diagram is the ACE commuter rail service that follows along this route. Um, it's only peak hour into San Jose right now, but they're working to improve that. And then the vast Metrolink network down here and um, that was built from scratch in the last 30 years. So that's the foundation. And I just wanted, this is the uh, top city pairs on the San Joaquin's. Uh, and the San Joaquin's are this, this yellow, here, and I wanna point out here that Sacramento, um, most of the traffic on that is actually by bus. Um, if you keep coming down here, uh, Los Angeles bus, right? Just kind of going down here, you've got a lot of bus origins, San Francisco, et cetera, right? So the reason that it works in the Valley with the San Joaquin is because of those buses. Um, uh, there were a couple of questions going back. Uh, so 160 mile an hour operations in New Jersey should start operating in the next year or so. Um, right now, 110 is just Porter to Kalamazoo, but uh, Dearborn's in the works. Um, and this is, uh, the ridership here is um, 2018. Um, and we'll talk about how high-speed rail really boosts this up in a minute. Um, so the next big innovation was the voters approved to build high-speed rail in 2008. And this looks like CGI, but it's not. This is the actual Finnish bridge over the, um, uh, shoot. I forgot what river this is, I apologize. Um, it's just outside of Fresno, San Joaquin River. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the voters approved to get this project started and uh, uh, that is exciting and it's well underway. And the key decision is, do they continue to move forward with this aggressively or not? And that's the, the the decision that the legislature will make this spring. Um, and then the most kind of exciting to me innovation in California is this integrated plan. And this is a diagram of the train operations that they are planning on for 2040. So the red is high speed trains, not necessarily high speed lines. Uh, and the green and blue are um, um, regional trains. Um, 
different sorts of trains at different frequencies. But the key point here is it's a, it's a statewide plan. It's not a segment by segment plan. And those square boxes are places where the trains and buses will be timed to meet on the same schedule every hour. So maybe a train runs every two hours, but it will be there at 15 minutes after the hour. Maybe a train runs every 30 minutes. So at that station, it would be there at 15 and 45. Um, and, and the stations would be designed to make easy transfers very doable. Um, and they're planning on one ticket will take you anywhere in the state. This is huge. And because they've done this 2040 plan, they can now work backwards and say, we should prioritize, prioritize this piece or this piece. Oh, this piece needs to be a lot more robust than we were thinking. This piece, we don't have to make it so robust, right? But because they have a big picture plan, they can think that true. Um, So uh, this is huge. And then this demonstrates how huge this is. So uh, these are the listings of counties from north to south. And then these hoops are the ridership between counties. And this includes um, the commuter rail systems like Caltrain and Metrolink and includes the Amtrak connecting buses. And I wanna point out here in the Midwest, we would consider Fresno a pretty decent sized Amtrak stop. And you'll notice it doesn't really show up here because it wouldn't scale properly to this. If they continued with all the projects when they were doing this plan, all of the projects that were in process, they continued them independently as they were planned. You have a big ridership increase. It's a huge impact. And now you're adding ridership to rural counties um, that wouldn't have had dramatic impact otherwise. But if you do it in this coordinated way and spend a little bit more money um, uh, moving it forward or to, to do the connections, um, you have a tenfold increase over what's happening today. This is what every state should be doing in the country. We should have this on a regional level and then on a national level at different scales of detail each step along the way. Um, this is really, and California is the first in the country to do this, uh, following Switzerland, Germany, and, and the Netherlands uh, to actually put this going, uh, pu pushing this forward. Uh, so this is a draft map that we're working on to more simplify the discussion. Um, and I wanna point out it's a draft because there are a couple of errors in here, uh, but we've been rushing uh, to really simplify our communications for uh, next Friday. There's a big date, a big event happening next Friday uh, that I'll talk to you at the, about at the end of this. Uh, but this is the high speed, the network of high speed lines and regional lines proposed for California and the status of each. So orange is under construction now. Um, the green is fully environmentally cleared, cleared with the Surface Transportation Board, um, ready to go to construction. Um, and um, the purple is very close to finishing the uh, environmental clearance and the other federal clearances and state clearances you need to go to construction, that's in purple. Uh, that'll all be done in the next year or two, each piece of it coming on at a different time, but it should be done by the end of 2022. So a lot of progress here. One of the errors I wanna point out real quick is that Shafter, this little town here, uh, to Bakersfield is actually environmentally cleared. Uh, uh, but that's one of the more egregious errors on this map. And then these dark, these thicker lines are the existing shared use lines and the buses are um, uh, the connecting bus lines or the thinner lines. So it really is uh, a statewide network. So here's what the authority's plan is as approved by the board um, 
uh, last to within the last month. So you've got Caltrain under construction now. That's very exciting. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, you've got Madeira to Shafter under construction. There's a long history of why that is. There's good reasons why that is for just that small segment. Um, it wasn't, in, that was intended to be the first, like let's get things started and keep moving. And a very organized uh, base of opposition has done all they can to slow the um, uh, process down. Um, and so uh, it's exciting that it's under construction. And then they've got these green segments under, are fully ready to go. And so the authority has agreed that they are want to move forward fast with getting Merced to Bakersfield done. Um, and uh, that's what they're asking the authority to uh, release money for. The other things they wanna do is get very aggressive on preparing for pre-construction for these segments over the mountains. And I wanna point out one important thing here. These white areas are where the land is flat. Um, so if you, if you don't understand how hard it is to get across to Hetchepes or through the San Gabriel Mountains, um, it's difficult to understand why you'd start here. Also, the other issue is most people drive I-5, which comes along here. These are fairly big cities along uh, California 99, uh, but most people making that drive don't see those cities. Um, and so they think this is in the middle of nowhere, but these really are big places. And there's a lot of traffic happening already today on the San Joaquins from this part of the valley to LA with that bus connection. And then you've got Bakersfield coming up here. Um, so this piece in the middle really makes a huge difference. Now, this goes from pre-COVID seven trains a day. The plan was to go to eight or nine trains a day on the San Joaquins that's still in the works post COVID though it's been delayed. With high speed with the Merced to Bakersfield piece, that goes from seven to 18. And remember frequency is critical to attracting people from their cars. Um, so you are more than doubling the frequencies by building the high speed line. The other piece you're doing is you're cutting that trip time from three hours to 90 minutes. You're cutting the trip in half. So even if you allow 10 minutes for changing trains in Merced or changing to a bus in Bakersfield, you have so changed the quality of that trip that um, it, this is going to be a game changer. Um, and then that the next thing that happens is that the buses that connect down to the Los Angeles basin and across here, especially this, 18 buses a day. So again, you're doubling the frequencies. And if they make a small tweak to their laws, it actually then becomes possible to take buses. These buses become incredibly frequent buses for the people in between as well. So it's a huge change for the bus service at both ends and then for Merced to Sacramento, today there are the seven pre-COVID, there were seven trains a day going to Stockton. And then they would split, um, they would split, uh, today at pre-COVID it was two to Sacramento and uh, five down to San Jose and Oakland. Um, there would be 18 um, and some of them would go to Sacramento, some would go around the mountains this way. And then um, there is a proposal called Valley Link um, that would build, expand the ACE service uh, across the Antelope. Um, this is not doing what I wanted to do. Would expand the ACE service across the Antelope Valley here. So you would have 18 trains a day meeting the high-speed trains at Merced. 
Um, and then that they're also highly frequent service from Merced and Madera across uh, Pateco Pass to San Jose. Um, uh, so two clarifications. So I missed, so uh, to be very clear, uh, Bakersfield to Merced is the piece that with the authorities plan goes from three hours down to 90 minutes from seven trains a day to 18 trains a day. Uh, Marvin is telling me the law was already changed. Um, that's great. Um, Altamont Pass is here, if I said that wrong, and Pacheco Pass is here. Um, Kirk is saying the change of bus ball will make the buses less desirable because they will still make, they will need to make all stops. They're already making the stops. This increases the volume to make the, the buses work well. Um, and Antelope Valley is here. Uh, San Jose to Merced, yes. So um, Tom is pointing out that different segments are coming in at different times with the plan to have it all done by the end of next year. So I've, I've got slightly different. The point is they're talking about building new infrastructure that would be shared between ACE commuter trains and new regional trains. Uh, they're building the new infrastructure here and ACE will be able to use it to speed to trip and add frequencies to San Jose. It will also have more local service that will connect to BART at Dublin. Um, and that's part of this issue with having an integrated plan so that you can see how one piece of infrastructure will improve a lot of different services. Um, and, um, uh, and just to be clear, uh, apparently I'm using the wrong terms. So I want to be clear again, this is the Antelope Valley and this is the Altamont Pass. Uh, so thanks for folks pointing that out. And how am I doing on time? I feel like I'm going wrong. Okay. So next, I want to point out that California is driving a huge innovation for the whole country, not only in creating regional rail. So they are taking a diesel commuter line that was already one of the best in the country between San Jose and San Francisco that got a huge upgrade at the end of the 90s to run much more frequent service and a really interesting pattern of expresses and locals. Now they are electrifying it so that commuter trains can go 110 miles an hour and they will operate it much more like a subway in terms of the operating pattern, which makes it work a lot better for suburb to suburb trips and trips throughout the day, not just peak trips. This is what all commuter rail should be working towards all across the country. And they are driving this innovation in the Silicon Valley. And this is, the other piece of this is, they're the first for a mainline railroad to use the safer and less expensive to operate um, alternate safety standards, not the heavy um, um, old safety standards. So this really is a huge, huge innovation and exciting project that will drive a lot of innovations around the country. That's underway. Um, um, and Marvin's comment is about, uh, they don't have the funding to switch to full level boarding um, yet. And that's part of the challenge. Um, um, and this project would not have happened without high-speed rail. Uh, so uh, they are using a decent chunk of the voter approved funds. And I'm excited that this is happening because um, this is the right way to do it, doing piece by piece and adding things that make the whole network better. So um, the funding for this, this project was made possible with high-speed rail funding. 
that's great. And then the next step up in getting to full level boarding and getting the high speed trains on there, that's the next step. That's exciting and it needs to move forward. Um, and um, Vaughn, I'm not quite sure. Um, I will look into that. Um, uh, Caltrain owns the tracks between San Francisco and San Jose, absolutely. Um, uh, okay. Um, so this is a huge innovation that we should be learning from and, and bringing across the country. And then this is the, the map of the services. I'm sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself in the previous map, but these are all the bus lines that improve if you build this section here and get it to 18 trains a day. All of these bus lines are improved for a hugely boosted service. And then ACE is already under uh, way to extend from Stockton down to Merced. This is the San Joaquin line. They're already well underway for expanding service on the San Joaquin, actually a service from Stockton up to Sacramento. And then we talked about the improvements that are planned for getting down to San Jose. So between these three routes, you'll have 18 trains a day, plus a lot more buses. Uh, so this becomes a much more robust network up here. Um, and uh, Vaughn is pointing out the issues with uh, Caltrain funding, um, and that's an issue that we have to continue to fight. And Peter, yes, you're right. Uh, this is an old map that we grabbed from another presentation. Um, it's Brightline uh, over here for Virgin. And I want to point out that this is really also an exciting development. So uh, Brightline is ready to go to construction. They're doing the pre-construction work right now. Um, and that was financed by essentially, this is not technically true, but that was financed by a, a casino owner because he recognized that his business required high-speed trains to California. And he knows where all of his customers come from, right? And so where do his customers come from? They come from the Valley and from the Inland Empire for the most part. Right, and all those people have to drive by Victorville um, in order to get there. Um, and that's the first good segment. And they are already planning, they're doing the design work for coming down uh, Cajon Pass to uh, hook up with Metrolink, which could be upgraded to Caltrain standards. I wanna be clear that's not planned, but it should be. Um, and then the environmental is, is wrapping up to get you to Palmdale. But based on what's underway, by the end of the decade, California could have this network. Um, and remember, there's a lot of bus traffic from Bakersfield to Las Vegas. That travel time gets dramatically reduced by making these connections. So the conservative estimate, um, Richard Martin is asking who's the bus service operator. Amtrak uh, contracts with a variety of, of uh, bus companies um, and the buses are standard over the road buses. Um, uh, that, that, uh, um, and Kirk is pointing out buses should be separated to express and locals. That's absolutely true. And you can start to do that at the volumes that happen if you have high speed rail. Um, and Walter, thank you for pointing out. I wanted to point out Hanford and Corcoran here. Um, uh, that is a very important market. You're absolutely correct. And the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority right now is doing the plans uh, to make sure that they get at least the frequency that they get now and perhaps different based on serving their market properly. It may be bus or train or some combination or above of the both. 
Uh, but again, I want to point out, if you bring a lot of volume into the system because of that high speed line, because of the connecting aspect of this, it makes it possible perhaps to create a much better service than what they have. Again, it might be much more frequent bus service, but um, I think this is a huge improvement for both of those communities. Okay, um, so uh, this is the, oh, this is the connection at um, Merced. So the existing Amtrak station is basically about here by this B in the BNSF. Um, they're under design right now for building a connection from BNSF um, over to a new station. The high-speed line will be built above the Union Pacific tracks and a new station we build, will be built here. The design is not uh, complete. This is basically a concept of what needs to happen, uh, but, but this is how that connection happens to uh, the ACE commuter trains will continue up on the Union Pacific, and then the San Joaquin Amtrak trains will go up on BNSF. Um, and this, this is a concept to illustrate the fact that it will be a cross-platform transfer. Um, I'm disappointed that they've rendered it with people standing around because this is going to be a quick walk across from one train to the others and the buses will have an easy connection below. I find it interesting that they are suggesting here that it will be Santa Fe high levels. Certainly there will be much more, more modern equipment there. Um, um, uh, as opposed to Santa Fe high levels. Uh, but this is just to point out the easy connection. I do this frequently um, at Belmont between the brown line and the red line. Um, there have been a couple of places over time as they phased the Japanese high-speed line um, into operation. There's been a couple of places where they've done this in Japan. Um, so this really is um, a very viable um, uh, um, option. Um, and there's lots of places in Germany where you do this as well. So this has been, uh, was done by Deutsche Bahn, uh, the analysis, and it was confirmed by an independent review board um, that uh, this will conservatively double ridership on that entire network. Um, it will more than double revenue because uh, with the frequency and speed, people will be willing to pay a little bit more. Um, and that means the cost of running that network that already exists goes down. And um, they can um, then use that money to, to improve other services elsewhere or, or take it to... to, uh, to um, further work on the high-speed line. So again, this part of doing it step-by-step, step, if you've got a big enough step in the beginning, you really can set the stage for big, exciting stuff later. And if they do this, this makes it, let's go back here to this map here. The hardest part of doing this is the Tehachapi's and going down the San Gabriel Mountain. If you've got a, sand, a high speed line coming into essentially, um, actually all the way to Palmdale, and then you've got Metrolink that already takes a small trip up, but it's there, right? Plus the buses, you now have, a, and you've got the high speed line here with all the stuff that's happening there. You now have a much stronger political and business case for doing these two really hard pieces. And you could not make the legislature take that leap without having high-speed trains in operation on these two segments. So uh, that's really why it's critical that the legislature make this the first step in building high-speed rail across the country. Um, and uh, uh, Richard is, bringing up the issue of construction costs. Um, 
And there's lots of discussions about why construction costs are higher here versus other places that other forms have taken on. I, that's an issue. I don't have the answer to it. Um, again, I think if there had been a much more ro robust planning effort in the beginning early on, um, I think that it could have come in um, differently, um, but that's water on the, under the bridge. So again, the core lesson is do the planning up front and early, which is why I am sad that uh, Midwestern states, my home region, hasn't done any high-speed rail planning to date. It's very disappointing. Um, so here's what happens. We're getting towards the end. Um, um, uh, oh, and acquiring land. Mark, uh, Mark is asking, is the authority starting to acquire land uh, for getting over those two passes? And they cannot do that until they have full environmental clearance. Um, and then they're gonna need funding to do that. So that's another reason why we need the legislature to approve releasing the entire 4.1 now so that they can work aggressively towards um, doing that, that pre-construction work in land acquisition. Um, Okay, um, so what's next? Um, we need the legislature to um, release the remaining $4 billion in order to fund the plan that the authority put together a couple of weeks ago. That's the core issue. Um, we are helping our members in California um, educate board leaders on why that is important right now. Um, uh, the next step is next Friday, the governor will release his budget revise, um, which is his proposal for what the legislature does for the entire operation of the, the uh, uh, California, oper or the entire California operations, right? Um, but at that point, we're off to the races and we've got about a month where the legislature will decide what to do. So it is critical that we get all of our friends in California in the next several weeks, getting lots of messages into Sacramento saying, it's time to move forward with um, um, high-speed high speed rail. That's the critical thing. Um, and we'll have, um, we're uh, wrapping up the final work on, on the public release of that um, in this week. And uh, this, that's really, this is the critical time nationally. Imagine if there's a clear vote in Sacramento for high-speed rail. And now in DC, they're debating what to do with the high-speed rail program nationally. And you've got legislators in California pushing for a national program to keep this program moving. That's why California is so critical to the national network. Um, and that's the basic short of the story. Um, Steve, I don't understand your question. Uh, confusing two systems, 400 versus uh, higher 160 and high 400. I don't understand that question. Um, um, Howard, yes, the Biden administration can encourage uh, California. Um, we wish we had uh, a lot more presence in California right now, or I'm sorry, in Texas, um, as they you know work forward on their next steps. And there might, uh, Marvin is making the comment, there might be need to convince Nevada to pitch money into Bakersfield to Palmdale. Um, um, and that's why we have a federal government and a federal program. We're not structured to have states work together. 
Um, and uh, let's see here, we're five minutes away. Um, uh, let's go back. I think, Steve, what you're asking is, uh, on this map here, this will be 220 miles an hour here, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 miles an hour in the, this section, 110 miles an hour, San Jose to San Francisco. Um, and then uh, they're planning for variety of speeds, but a top of 220 across the passes. Um, we want to be very clear, every piece that they build um, has to result in a trip time of San Francisco to LA of two hours and 40 minutes or less. That's for a nonstop train. Um, and that was done to make sure that they didn't accidentally spend the money on transit instead of high-speed rail. This is about the distance of Paris to Lyon, and they're doing it in three hours pre-COVID. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Steve. Um, I've just been looking at the chats, which might be an issue. Um, let me see if I missed anything. And I'm sorry, Mary, the, the uh, cursor issue, I tried it, I couldn't get it to work at that point. Um, uh, Fred, the LA to Las Vegas service is, uh, they would largely overlap. Um, they've proposed it. This map that we're using here is the 2028 vision it is from the, uh, 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 sorry, San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority. And uh, to clarify, will Amtrak San Joaquin's continue to Bakersfield from Merced? Um, um, and I think I covered that, but the answer is no. They might use those slots for different kinds of trains that are focused on uh, just those valley stops, or they might really amp, amp up their bus service or something in between. And Tom, Paris. So Tom is correcting me on distances. I said Lyon, I meant Marseille. Um, uh, Paris to Marseille. If I said Lyon, there's the problem. Paris, Mar Marseille. Um, and Mark, you're absolutely right. Um, the National Network is long overdue. And uh, emphasize again, Paris, Paris to Marseille. And uh, the point being on day one, high-speed trains went all the way from Paris to Marseille, um, even though there was only a section in the middle of about 120 miles. And they're talking about 120 miles in the uh, Central Valley. So we're up against an hour. If you wanna get involved, how do I get this to move back where it needs to go? Uh, there's, we're updating this now as we speak. The basic information is at hsrail.california. Please get your friends anywhere, anyhow, to sign a petition. Um, if you've got friends in California, get them to send a message to Sacramento. Um, and um, if you take either one of those two actions, please do them both if you're in California. You'll be on our email list for updates moving forward. 